Hello, and thank you for joining our third annual Day with DESA. Before the session gets started, let's go over a few things. A copy of the presentation will be available to download once the session has ended under the materials section. If you have questions about the information in this session, enter them in the Q&A section below and the speaker will answer them once the session has ended. If we don't get to your question, we'll reach out to you at the end of the conference. If you have questions about the topics or trends that are mentioned throughout Day with DESA and how they pertain to your company, and you'd like to reach out to one of our team members directly, hit the chat icon at the bottom of daywithdesa.com and you'll be connected directly with one of our team members. Thank you for attending live. Each of our live attendees is eligible for our prize drawing at the end of the conference. And each session that you attend live increases your chances of winning either a Nintendo bundle or a brand new iPhone 12. Finally, I'd like to take this time to thank all of our sponsors for their participation today with DISA. Specifically, I'd like to call out CRL, our title sponsor for three years running. We'd like to thank our platinum sponsors, Orisher, Quest Diagnostics, Samba Safety, and Psychomedics. All of our sponsor support is greatly appreciated. With that, let's get started. Enjoy your session. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for this session, the Occupational Health Industry Outlook and Update. Today we've got two industry leading presenters. We've got Kim Olszewski, Director of Client and Medical Provider Services for DESA Global Solutions. She's also the President-Elect for the American Association of Occupational Health Nurses, AAOHN. And we're joined by Anne-Marie Percelli, MD. She's the National Medical Director of Transportation for Concentra. Thank you so much to both of you for joining us today. Uh, with that being said, Kim? All right, thank you, Thomas. First, we're gonna talk about what did 2019 look like going into 2022? And there was five occupational health trends um, that were anticipated at the end of 2019. And the first being high-tech workplace safety programs. Companies were looking to move towards using mobile applications and looking for ways to not only help their employees from a safety perspective, but a health perspective as well. A lot of technology was anticipated to be used for training programs and again, keeping connection with, with all employees. The next trend was looking at safety professionals becoming more generalists. And historically, some of the safety professionals may focus on, say, perhaps industrial hygiene, perhaps environmental. Um, going back to the thought that, you know, safety professionals really need to be more generalists, that they're experts in everything and have a touch and responsibility for all aspects of safety. Next was the focus on total health. And we heard the term or the concept of total worker health from NIOSH. And looking at that concept, we're looking at not only what happens with our workers and their well being from a physical and emotional standpoint, but we're looking at it from both work and at home. So we know what happens um, with our employees at home can also carry into what happens um, in the workplace. So employers were looking to really adopt and the drive for total worker health was really going to be enforced uh, to help with programs and ways to mitigate some of those issues. Again, that might spill over from the home environment to the workplace or vice versa. Next was safety concerns in a changing workplace environment. And we knew, you know, telecommuting was not something new that started in 2020 when COVID started. Telecommuting was really being utilized um, for all aspects of, of businesses. We were seeing more and more of that and we were seeing more flexible work schedules. Uh, with that came some challenges that we need to think about. What does training look like for those employees? How do we keep that culture of safety alive when they're at home or at travel? And how are we gonna address protocols to adapt to this new type of work environment? So we were kind of forethinking that at the end of 2019 before 2020 got here. And lastly, one of the bigger things, and we talk about this really all across industry standard, is talking about the demographics in our workplace. And we're seeing more of what we call that millennial generation um, coming into the workforce. And we're seeing from an occupational health standpoint, 
we're seeing it's harder from what I'm hearing from my peers in the ERCs and some of the other occupational health industries is we're having a harder time recruiting millennials into occupational safety and health. And one of the trends or one of the issues that was identified going into 2020 was the fact that sometimes these candidates that we're utilizing in occupational safety and health are actually because they have a lot of experience and they were being promoted within the workplace versus having the training. So these were some of the trends that kind of going into 2020 that the industry leaders were saying these were hot topics or areas of focus. Well, 2020 rolled around and things have changed pretty rapidly. And what happened at the end, actually December 31st of 2019, China announced that there was a pneumonia-like illness in Wuhan, China. And we quickly found that in January 20th when America saw their first case of COVID. So COVID hit us right after the end of um, 2019. And it wasn't until about January 31st when it was really identified as a public health crisis. Um, as we know, fast forward to March, um, things got really kind of involved with COVID at that point. There was 50 states involved at that point, and President uh, Trump declared that a national emergency at that time. So, um, and we're still dealing with it. So, but that hit us right at the turn of the new year, uh, we had COVID. Um, something else that affected us pretty, pretty traumatically, in April, it was predicted that there'd be about 16 named storms, including eight hurricanes. Fast forward to August, where we are now, extremely active, says NOAA, with um, storm systems. And we are on our 27th named storm, named Zeta, only to be tied now with what the storm situation is unprecedented from when um, Katrina hit. Uh, so it's been a very active storm season, which has impacted business, it's impacted safety. Um, you know, and coupled with COVID, we've seen a lot of traumatic um, things that came out of that. Um, the third kind of picture that, that you see here on your slide is not only have we dealt with, you know, a virus, we've dealt with some weather issues, but we've also dealt with the fires. Again, unprecedented times where we have 44,000 fires on record um, and still burning, and currently some new fires that have been sparked, mainly in the West, um, but there's been about 7.7 .7 million acres that have been involved. So when we think about that and you couple in the things that happened this year with, with rioting, you talk about companies closing and you talk about all these different national disasters, um, things have really been in a turmoil um, getting through 2020. And you know, COVID, I'm not gonna spend our time talking about COVID today, but I've put these slides together back on October 19th. And you can see there the cases were at, at 8.1, uh, million with 218,000 deaths. We're at 8.7 million cases with 225,000 deaths. So we're seeing resurgences across the country. Uh, when I pulled the COVID tracker for this particular slide, you can see the dark orange areas were some of the, what we would call hot spots. And now we're seeing those spots spread even more. Uh, these numbers keep, keep moving, but this was just a snapshot in time back on October 19th uh, when I put this together. Really just to give you kind of a thought on, on where we are. But if we break the stats down, and again, these stats are constantly changing too, but it, it's just more to think about and how COVID has really affected us and how it's affecting the population. Um, to date, there's been over 126 million tests done. Uh, that number is growing exponentially by the day. And the U.S. leads the world in about 8.7 8 million positive cases now. So again, that number has increased since I put these slides together. There's approximately 225,000 deaths. And we look at how the employment rate um, really affected kind of the numbers as well. March at our all-time high for this year was at 14%. Uh, I just checked the current stats. We're currently at 7.9, but certainly there's a lot of things that are, that are making that number move both both um, up right now because of some of these natural disasters and also because um, of the climate of companies being able to um, having to downsize or close. Industries affected, really it's every industry has been affected. I, I can't say that I can speak to one industry that has not been affected, including healthcare, um, certainly in a negative way. Um, hospitality, service, entertainment, travel, 
uh, every service industry that I can think of, any industry that I can think of has had some type of impact um, as a result of all these things that we just talked about. So this year has been very, very trying um, as far as businesses trying to, to reinvent, to stay viable and to, to stay current, obviously, with all the things that are going on in the world. I found this article in the um, New England Journal of Medicine. It was just published back in July. And it speaks to some of the big impacts that, it, that happen in healthcare as a result of COVID. And it's really, I, they, they say to COVID, but I really feel that a lot of these natural disasters and things that, that are going on that I mentioned had an impact profoundly on what's going on in the world with healthcare. So healthcare you know, coverage, we've seen that employment rate, unemployment rate considerably um, go up in March. And as a consequence to that, there was a lot of jobs that were lost. Um, and there's still people that are coming out of this, um, you know, kind of bad time with unemployment that we're seeing a lot of people being either underinsured or uninsured. So healthcare coverage is certainly a huge concern uh, as a result of what happened with COVID. And the next statement doesn't seem possible, but it is. There's huge financial losses for providers. And you know, if you read kind of the article, it'll tell you that on one side of kind of on one school of thought is there was a huge increase in specialty visits, such as infectious disease, obviously with COVID. But on the flip side, where we have the kind of routine visits, where those visits were curtailed or scheduled surgeries, uh, things of that nature were cut during COVID, there was a huge loss for uh, those regular routine visits. So providers were being displaced or providers were being, you know, kind of let go because there was no need for them. And the statistics show that hospitals lost in 2020. So a hospital system lost upwards of $323 billion just with all the changes that occurred as a result of COVID. So it had a profound impact on, on our healthcare system for sure. So all those elective surgeries and things that really provided a lot of revenue streams for hospitals, they were all stopped for many, many months. And in speaking with some of the orthopedic surgeons and things in my local area, uh, they're concerned that it might get back to that point again, depending on where, where things are with, with COVID in the research. Um, the next point that the article brought up was the substantial racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare system. Um, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this topic, but but speaking to you know certain racial or ethnic groups that are um, you know more, I guess, affected uh, by COVID, but also have been more affected by food and housing insecurities through this whole pandemic, as well as um, being underinsured. So they spent a lot of time talking about that in this article as well. And the last piece there was talking about the crisis um, in, in the public health and talking about, you know, I just went through all the statistics and, and what it's really done um, to our public health system. But I'll, I'll leave you with a quote from this article. Um, it kind of ended with this profound thought of, uh, from Winston Churchill, it says, one should never let a crisis go to waste we may now have the opportunity to reform a flawed healthcare system that made the novel coronavirus far more damaging in the United States than it had to be. And I know that's a huge subject of debate, but the moral of that, that kind of takeaway there from that quote is we have a lot to learn from, from what happened in the last 10 months and um, good and bad. And I'm going to talk about some of the good here in just a couple of minutes. So where did occupational health kind of shake out in the middle of this whole pandemic? Um, I worked right through the whole pandemic. I'm a, a nurse practitioner by education and, and our clinics here at DESA stayed open through the pandemic and we supported the employers as did many other um, institutions in occupational health. But I can tell you our role kind of changed a little bit. So we continued to do our, our typical day to day. We were medical providers, but we also turned into health screeners we were out doing temperature taking. We were out being resources on PPE. Uh, we were trying to get homemade masks made for the truck drivers to give to them to be protected as they were considered, you know, certainly um, a provider that needed to, an essential worker that needed to be out providing care. Um, education, tons and tons of time talking to supervisors, management, employees, and 
and educating them on the best resources to look at when making decisions on COVID. We've learned to be contract, contract tracing people where we were public health experts and helping really to solve you know, where this pandemic is affecting employers in their workplace. We were a return to work resource. We've been doing telemedicine and trying to get to um, the employers not only from a return to work standpoint, but a fitness for duty resource as well. So our roles really changed. It's a lot of what we've done before, but certainly we have added to being a big piece of that was education and helping people understand how to protect themselves and how to protect um, their employees. So where do we go from here? Um, 2021 and beyond. I mentioned total worker health. That was one of the initiatives, again, at the end of 2019, uh, that was considered an initiative for occupational health professionals. And I'm a believer in this. I've done presentations on this internationally, nationally, um, through AAOHN. And AAOHN is a partner affiliate uh, with NIOSH for the Total Worker Health Initiative. And, um, you know, if you haven't spent a lot of time thinking about this, is really to kind of whet your appetite on what Total Worker Health is. But it is defined as policy, programs, and practices that integrate protection from work-related safety and health hazards with promotion of injury and illness prevention efforts to advance worker well-being. And that's a big mouthful for a definition, um, but the benefits are twofold from the employee and the employer standpoint. Um, engaging in total worker health um, initiatives makes for a happier employee, a less stressful um, type work environment, and it's just good business. Um, employees stay engaged, they stay healthier, and again, they're bringing some of these initiatives home to their families. From an employer standpoint, um, there's a lot of financial incentives to doing that because of the cost of injuries and illnesses, um, changes that they can make within their environment at work to make workers more engaged and more happy, and addressing a lot of these longstanding health and safety initiatives. So it's, it's a really good uh, program. Um, there's a lot of free resources out there for you to get started. There's a toolkit for NIOSH from NIOSH on you know, implementing total worker health, self-assessments, um, workplace assessments, just tons of resources. So I certainly think there's a lot of value in that. Next is telehealth telemedicine. Um, you know, as we look at kind of the future, uh, we've been using telemedicine for a long time and we've been utilizing uh, more and more of artificial intelligence or AI as we call it. So what that really is doing is bringing that provider much closer to the patient in a much more cost effective way. And I'm, I'm all about the numbers. I like to talk about statistics. So ER visits, um, just think about an ER visit when you send an employee there. The average cost of an ER visit is about $1,734. Compare that to, um, you know, if we send someone in for an office visit, for a regular routine office visit, which that takes that cost way down to about $146. Now we add in telehealth. Telehealth is much more efficient, gets to the patient faster, and now that visit's down to $79 a visit. So from a, you know, a, an expenditure standpoint, that's certainly really, really good um, cost savings. And UPMC, which is the health system here, uh, one of the health systems here in Pennsylvania, it's the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. They stated they save $86.64 every time an online visit replaces an on-site visit. So they have been really seeing the cost benefits of pushing telehealth telemedicine. So we've, we've kind of sold people in the fact it increases access to care, um, it reduces healthcare costs, it enhances that traditional face-to-face -face medicine, and they speak to kind of the time frame. And a traditional time visit, so if you think about by the time you get in the car, you drive to your office a visit, you have to sit and wait, you go see the provider, you check out, you go home, it takes about, a, they're estimating about two hours to do a traditional office visit, whereas a telehealth visit can take as little as 16 minutes. So think about how efficient it is for the patient and how efficient it is for the provider. Um, and especially because there's incentives in place that you can actually be charging for no-shows and time on the phone um, from a provider revenue standpoint. So it's a huge time, you know, time saver as well. 
the ultimate key indicator though, are the patients happy with it? And you know, by and large, there's been a lot of studies out there that you know, companies are happy with telehealth, healthcare institutions are certainly seeing satisfaction. Um, but what's most important is we're seeing improved patient outcomes. So patients that were typically maybe non-compliant or didn't do follow-up visits, they are more apt to stay um, engaged and involved in a telehealth visit because of the ability to be seen you know, from even their iPhones or some type of technology that makes it very convenient for them. So I definitely think this is certainly the way of the future. I think we're gonna see more and more of it. COVID just kind of you know, pushed us in that direction a little faster than what some institutions wanted to be. But, you know, there's a lot of models out there for companies to really um, make this very profitable and accessible for the employees. Lastly, one of the trends um, that I wanted to talk about was social media and mobile applications. And certainly, you know, we, we mostly all have smartphones and some type of social media device you know, whether that be, you know, Twitter, the president likes Twitter, but whether that be, you know, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, whatever your, your social media, you know, appetite involves, or mobile apps, there's a lot of opportunity from a safety, health, and wellness perspective in occupational medicine. As of now, I looked, again, I'm all about the numbers, I like to see, right now there's 2.7 million apps out there in Google. So, you know, second to Apple, who has about 1.82 uh, million. So Google is leading in apps right now, and the most popular app, and you can imagine, is gaming. You know, the gaming apps are certainly the most popular. Uh, about 21.8% of um, people are downloading um, gaming applications. Second to that is business applications. So about 10% is, is looking at using mobile applications for business, as well as about 8.6% using it for education and then fitness falls down at about 3.41. But you can see where mobile applications have really taken over our way of thinking and our way of living. Social media obviously is, is another good source to get groups together um, from a safety and health perspective. If there's information you need to share quickly from a group perspective, you can do listservs. I know here at DISA, we do a lot through social media. Uh, if you haven't been involved in any of our social media accounts, this is my plug for say get involved because we have a lot of good DOT information. We have a lot of good drug and alcohol testing information that gets pushed out every week. And we use social media a lot and it touches a lot of people very, very quickly. Um, from specifically health, we'll say M health, M safety, M environment. Uh, there's a lot of things out there. I just quickly looked over to see kind of what were the top health apps and safety apps for 2020. My Fitness Pal continues to be one of the top um, health apps, as well as Sleep Cycle for, for sleep, um, people that have sleep disorders. Headspace, um, not familiar with that one so much, but Fujicate. Fujicate's really nice because you can scan labels in grocery stores and get information on nutritional values. It can do all kinds of recording of, of um, calorie counts and all of that. And the last one was called Photocracy with an F. And photocracy is actually, you know, for our kids that we're trying to get involved or even, um, even our adults, but it combines health and safety information with gaming. So it's actually a gaming app as well. Um, from a safety perspective, um, for those of us that travel, for those of us that are out um, maybe working remotely, there's a lot of personal safety apps out there that you can um, tell your employees to do. Circle of Six, Silent Beacon, red pain button and watch over me are just a few um, that you can hit a panic button on your phone and it GPSs your location immediately to where you are that they can alert safety professionals or EMS professionals to, to assist you. Um, from an industrial, industrial safety perspective, um, there's lots of apps out there from hazmat um, resources to um, there's an electrical arc app um, if you need to find calculations for that, job safety analysis, MSDS sheets, you name it, there's an app for it. Um, environment, there's a lot out there. EPA has a lot of good resources for um, environment. I, I like to use this example. My husband's a fisherman and he was at a local river doing um, his fishing and saw there was an oil leak and he texted me and he said, hey, what do I do about this? There's an app out there that actually will GPS the location on where the spill is that they can send the EPA officials right to that spot. 
and address the issue right as it's happening and take pictures and everything that they can contact officials. So there's just so many different things that we can use from a health, safety, and environmental perspective. So this is just to really kind of whet your appetite and, and see how that might be helpful. Um, lastly here, we wanted to talk just a, a minute about how does telemedicine and um, the commercial driver, and, and you know, we have these essential workers, the truck drivers out driving, um, but how can we get to them? How can we help them when they're constantly not perhaps able to make that connection with a family practitioner or their personal provider because they're, they're constantly in motion? And there's lots of different business models out there. Um, there's types that charge by the visit. There's types that charge by annual subscription. Um, I know Anne-Marie works for Concentra and I know they're doing a lot with telemedicine and, and she'll be talking to you about that next. But there's a lot of things that you don't think about that you can um, purchase diagnostic tools that connect right to your cell phones to listen to a heart rate, to look in an ear, to check an eye. And drivers can use those tools pretty inexpensively um, to get care that they need for non-urgent situations. And you know, maybe they're in a remote spot where they don't have access to internet. Um, truck stops, a lot of times, uh, will have space available that the truck drivers can make connections there um, in a HIPAA compliant, hopefully, area that, that's silent and private. Um, so there's a lot of things that, that we can do from a telemedicine perspective. Um, and you know, think about how we can maximize their, their time on the road and their health on the road. So with that, I'm going to turn over to um, Anne-Marie and she's gonna tell you a little bit more on you know, the DOT safety and the update with the truck drivers. So today I'm gonna to give you some FMCSA updates. Um, one of the first things that's happened recently is an FMCSA waiver in response to COVID-19. What initially happened on March 13th, 2020, the president declared a, a national emergency and the FMCSA followed on March 24th with the uh, waiver. The waiver uh, initially went into effect that um, March 24th, it was extended in June and then another uh, was renewed again September 18th uh, of 2020. And basically in order to meet the waiver requirements, uh, CDL, non-CDL, and CLP drivers uh, issued medical certificates uh, for, they must have been issued medical certificates for greater than equal to 90 days, which expired on or after June 1st, 2020. Um, they have until December 31st, 2020 to renew their medical examiner certificates without um, the FMCSA taking any enforcement action. Most states have uh, complied with this, but um, I've, I've heard that there are some difficulties uh, state by state with the uh, following this waiver. So the other um, uh, new rule that came into effect uh, in the last couple of years is the diabetes rule, uh, 391.46. Basically, the FMCSA eliminated, eliminated the federal uh, insulin diabetes exemption as of November 19, 2018. Uh, the exemption was first eliminated, and then later the waiver under the grandfather rule um, was eliminated in 2019. Uh, the process for the uh, complying with the new diabetes rule is the driver meets with their treating clinician. It must be uh, 45 days or, or less um, before their certification exam. Uh, they provide to their treating clinician 90 days of electronic blood glucose logs. Uh, then the treating clinician fills out the MCSA 5870, which can be found online. Uh, and it, it includes um, a bunch of questions and uh, a hemoglobin A1C within the past three months. Um, the medical examiner then reviews the information from the treating clinician. They perform an exam and they issue a medical examiner certificate if the driver is qualified. So as I said before, the MCSA 5874 needs to be uh, completed. Yeah, and basically the form asks a bunch of questions and uh, they wanna make sure that the driver is stable on their insulin dose. Um, any drivers with uh, severe non-proliferative retinopathy or uh, proliferative retinopathy, and those are pretty severe eye diseases that are known to diabetics, um, those are permanent disqualifiers. 
but only permanent disqualifiers for drive, uh, diabetic, uh, insulin-dependent diabetic drivers. Uh, individuals who've had severe hypoglycemia, very low blood sugar episode, that process has completely changed, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the non-insulin uh, dependent, dependent diabetic drivers can now be certified up to two years at the medical examiner's discretion. Basically, uh, how that came about is the FMCSA, uh, when they published the, the rule, said that um, they would not adopt the MRB's 2007 recommendation that all diabetic drivers uh, be certified only for one year. But in reality, most medical examiners only, cer uh, only certify drivers for uh, diabetic drivers for one year. So the severe hypoglycemic or low blood sugar episode, it's defined as requiring the assistance of others or resulting in a seizure, coma, or loss of consciousness. The driver must cease driving, uh, at least temporarily, and there's no mandatory waiting period any longer. So um, they really uh, need to see their treating clinician. Uh, the treating clinician completes a new MCSA 5870. Uh, once the cause of the hypoglycemia has been identified, they've been treated and they're again stable, they can resume driving um, without a new exam. Uh, the driver provides, however, they're required to provide that uh, new MCSA 5870 to the medical examiner at the next certification. Um, the rule does not state that the driver, as I mentioned, must have a new exam, but um, there is a regulation that still applies that any driver whose ability to perform his or her normal duties had, had, had been impaired by a physical or mental injury or disease is required to have a new exam. So let's talk a little bit about sleep apnea. This is a topic, a hot topic. It's continued to be over the last few years. Um, it's an area of emphasis for the FMCSA. This is because sleep apnea is more prevalent in CMV drivers. Uh, it's estimated that about 28% of them have sleep apnea as compared with 4% of men and 2% of women in the general population. Um, while there's not a lot of crash data for uh, commercial drivers due to sleep, regarding sleep apnea. Um, there are studies in passenger car drivers that show an increased risk of six to eight times that of somebody without sleep apnea. Um, so pressure from the NTSB, the public sector, insurance industry, and others is that we adequately address this issue. So let's talk about the, what happens when a driver is asleep at the wheel. And it doesn't have to be a long period of time. It can be a micro-sleep episode. So you can imagine a truck moving 60 miles per hour. They're traveling at 88 feet per second. The driver nods off for a micro-sleep episode of one second, and the vehicle's traveled 88 feet, plus another second to react, plus the stopping distance under ideal conditions um, equals about 400 feet traveled or a whole football field before the driver stops. It's estimated that um, excessive, drive, excessive driver sleepiness is implicated in 31 to 41 percent of CMV accidents. So there is no, we get this all the time, there's no regulation that says that you I have to get a sleep study. Well, there is a regulation, all the regulations uh, from the FMCSA regarding drivers are, are relatively vague. Um, and so the uh, sleep apnea is considered a respiratory disorder, and um, the standard for respiratory disorders is that a person's physically qualified if they have no established history or clinical diagnosis of a respiratory dysfunction likely to interfere with their ability to drive safely. So sleep apnea, clearly, what I just mentioned before, it can impair their ability to drive safely. Um, and the me medical expert panels really haven't helped. They're very unrecognized varying recommendations. Um, and so unfortunately, this uh, results in a high variability between uh, examiners when it comes to certifying drivers with sleep apnea. Um, regarding OSA and the FMCSA, the FMCSA did try an attempt to um, provide some um, more, uh, more regulation regarding sleep apnea. 
Um, on March 10th, 2016, uh, the FMCSA and the Federal Railroad Administration published an advance notice of proposed rulemaking concerning the evaluation of uh, safety sensitive personnel um, for moderate to severe sleep apnea. Um, the Medical Review Board met in 2016 and made recommendations uh, at the request of the FMCSA and FRA uh, regarding, regarding mandatory evaluation of those um, personnel and safety sensitive positions for OSA. However, on August uh, 8th, 2017, that rule was, uh, or the advance notice was withdrawn. Um, that had a lot to do with the new um, administration that was in office. Um, but this withdrawal only maintains the decision to evaluate a driver with OSA with the medical examiner. There's been no regulation passed or no proposed regulation that tells examiners that they cannot consider a driver's um, uh, possibility of having sleep apnea during an evaluation. So what those, the MRB recommendations were, um, first of all, the cutoff for a BMI was 33 or greater, um, and with three additional risk factors. For BMI alone, because it is highly associated with uh, sleep apnea, a BMI of 40 uh, or greater um, would, would be a cutoff, and they would uh, go for a sleep study or sleep evaluation. Um, the other, I won't read through all the risk factors, but um, the one in particular uh, that's highly associated with sleep apnea is the airway size, and it's called malampati. So a class three or four is highly associated with sleep apnea, and that um, would be a risk factor. So let's, we got, get a lot of questions about dental appliances. Um, there is limited data regarding their compliance and their long-term efficacy. Uh, what the MRB has said is that a driver with moderate to severe sleep apnea should try uh, a trial of um, CPAP before oral appliance therapy. Um, and so that's the state right now. A uh, driver may be certified for up to one year if they, a repeat sleep study shows resolution of their OSA. They've been cleared by that treating clinician. The driver must demonstrate objective compliance that is min the equivalent to the minimum compliance with CPAP therapy, um, and they cannot report excessive daytime sleepiness. So certification, um, overall the recommendation is one year maximum. Um, the MRB has said at that initial certification, when you're identifying a driver um, who has sleep apnea, they should show one month of adequate compliance and they could be issued a one-year medical examiner certificate. Uh, at research, the driver must document CPAP use for a, a period of time, no less than the number of days between the, um, the prior exam and the current exam. So that could be up to one year. They have to show of compliance data. Um, and Compliance is uh, use 70% or greater of nights, uh, nights greater than or equal to four hours. Um, and non-compliance may mean either no certificate, either they're put on determination pending or disqualified. Um, the FMCSA have recommended at least showing seven days of compliance and then consider a 30-day medical examiner certificate, 60-day, 90-day, and then finally one year if they're compliant. I think that's it. Thank you so much. I think that presentation was great. A um, lot of impactful information that certainly our, our uh, attendees are going to have to consider and think about how they can use and implement that in their own programs with their own companies. Um, a couple quick things before we dive into Q&A. Um, we've made a copy of the presentation available for everyone to download in the materials section at the bottom right. And then question and answer, we're going to start going through them as we receive them. If we don't answer your question today, if we run out of time, we're going to reach out to you after the event and try and respond to those as quickly as possible. So uh, with that being said, uh, Kim, we have a question for you. As the incoming president for AAOHN in April of next year, 2021, you'll be leading a national organization of occupational health nurses. So what guidance and direction will you see as paramount? in the coming months and years? Well, first and foremost, I think we need to maintain flexibility. Uh, we've, we've adapted to telecommuting. We've adapted to kind of, I, I hate saying those words, living with this new normal, um, but we are. We're living with a new normal. And um, so being 
incredibly flexible in how we deliver our care and assuring that the care is delivered, I think, is, is key. I think um, you need to embrace technology. I think technology is certainly here to stay. And I think we're going to find different and more creative ways to use that technology uh, to reach not only our workers, um, but our remote workers, such as um, the commercial drivers, as we mentioned. So flexibility and technology, I think, are going to be two of the key things going into 2021 for sure. Regarding federal waivers, um, do they mean that I shouldn't send in a driver for a recertification exam? No, not, not at all. Um, I'd actually encourage you to send in, or an employer to send in drivers. Um, one is that the driver workforce is, is older. Um, they tend to be prone to more um, you know, medical conditions that it could impact their ability to drive safely. Um, the other factor is that come December 31st, when the waiver expires, there may be a flood of drivers trying to get their certification. What if the driver develops a medical condition that's serious? Would the waiver cover that situation? No, there's, it's actually written into the waiver that um, if the driver does develop a, a medical condition that could impact their ability to um, drive safely, that the waiver doesn't apply and they really, they need to be recertified or have a new DOT exam. Kim, you mentioned the total worker health was an initiative of the future. Can you give us an example of how uh, total worker health has been successfully implemented in an organization? Sure. Um, actually, I had, I was doing this presentation um, last year and we like to share as a group when, you know, different initiatives are being, being done at different facilities. And one that really sticks out with me is one that was done um, in Central California. And it was a company that had a lot of migrant workers uh, working within their population. But from a total worker health perspective, they recognize that there might be some food insecurities, there might be some healthcare insecurities in that population. And this particular company uh, provided food banks um, that the migrant workers um, could take home to their families. They provided um, educational sessions on cooking and different type of classes that they can do healthier eating. They've also did yoga and things that involve not only the workers but the families. So it was, you know, really just a, a nice way to help with a bunch of different stressors that this particular vulnerable population has to deal with. Do you know what percentage of organizations are currently embracing total worker health? Probably, oh, that number keeps growing. I'm gonna say maybe in the 40s now, different organizations, national organizations that have signed on as affiliate members to the Total Worker Health Initiative. Um, it's really being driven by like ASSP, the American Society of Safety Professionals, certainly by AAOHN, AOHP, the American Association of Occupational Health Professionals. So um, it's, it's really being embraced and, and pushed out as an initiative. So um, go on to the CDC website. That would really give you a lot of tools and a lot of current statistics on where um, the organizations that are signing on, even unions um, are signing on um, for their workers. So it's really interesting. And Marie, uh, a question about the diabetes rule. Um, does the new federal diabetes rule cover intrastate drivers? Um, yes and no. Um, some states have not had waivers to begin with, so they follow the uh, FMCSA regulations, which in that case then the federal, the new rule would apply. Some states though um, have had, uh, are revising their waivers to meet the federal, the same federal uh, regulations. Um, but some states require their own waivers continue now yeah, um, so that the, the federal waiver, uh, federal um, rule wouldn't apply. And then another question for you on the sleep apnea test is, is a home sleep apnea test acceptable? Um, yes, it's acceptable. Um, it has to meet certain criteria. There have to be four separate channels that are measuring the sleep activity and the breathing activity. Um, it's best if the driver has a high um, kind of what we call pretest probability of having obstructive sleep apnea. So if they meet that criteria that are in the um, that I spoke of with the MRB, um, uh, and then many drivers. The, the problem with the home sleep study is a chain of custody. Is it that driver that is actually wearing that you know the sleep device? Um, so some um, of the, uh, the tests, the home sleep study testing has a chain of custody built in, which is uh, you know, the best if it's something, you know, if it, if it has a chain of custody. 
Um, and unfortunately, though, in about 15% of the cases, if the home sleep study uh, test is inconclusive, um, and which happens in 15% of the cases, uh, the, they have to go for an in-lab polysomnogram. Kim, the world drives on data and cellular, cellular use, and you mentioned mobile apps taking on a major role in managing Oc Health in the future. What would be the mobile app that you would like to see developed in the future to aid occupational health professionals? Well, first off, I'm not an IT person, but I would say um, what we need to do is, um, I think, collectively think about what are the things that are most important to us in occupational health and, and you know, look at, at, you know, health trackers and look at safety trackers and things that are important to, to your industry. And having a repository maybe at one app, um, I know a lot of universities have students that are just dying to come up with projects on what to do. So if you have an idea on what you think might be of interest to your employee population, um, collectively think about that and put it together, work with your local universities, and you could get your own app out there and customize it however you want. But I think you need to um, really have a place where someone can touch that button and get everything they need at one time. It's going to help with safety um, compliance. It's going to help with injury management. One other question, when would telehealth come into play over the traditional uh, in-office setup? Um, we're doing that to a degree now, even, even pre-COVID, you know, working with um, people that were on drilling sites that were working remotely. And, you know, they might, you know, use their cell phone to show me a laceration to say, do I need to get stitches now or can we bandage it? Or I have a musculoskeletal issue. Um, is it something that we can bring into the office tomorrow? Can we save that emergency room visit? So we're doing that now, um, even pre-COVID. And you know, now in the midst of COVID, we've been doing a lot of fitness for duty and return to work type consultation. One, so we don't have to be face-to-face -face in a room uh, for potential exposure, but two, um, you know, employers want to have the ability to, you know, have maybe their employees call in from the home environment. So I see a lot of it being done from a return to work fitness for duty standpoint, um, but a lot of it can be triaged. Um, you know, you can triage visits and, and save that emergency room visit, or um, you can do as a follow-up just to make sure there's compliance in the treatment. So we're not there yet with DOT physicals. <laughs> I mean, there's talk about what can be done remotely. We're not there yet. Um, but, you know, in the, in the truck driver population, you know, they have an upper respiratory infection and they need to, you know, get an antibiotic. How can they do that efficiently? Or can they get a medication that doesn't require fatigue or sleepiness? Um, a telemedicine visit might be the answer. It's not going to manage chest pain or something very, you know, significant, but it can guide them perhaps in the right direction very quickly versus them waiting till they can get to a healthcare facility. All right. Hey, that was great. Thank you so much, both Anne-Marie, Kim, for your time and, and sharing your wisdom and your knowledge. If someone watching wants to get a hold of you for more information, how should they do that? Um, email would be great. Email is fine for me as well. Um, and again, we'll be sharing the deck. It'll be in the material section below. Thank you everyone for attending uh, live and we hope to hear from you soon.